Hi, I'm Ed Ayers. I'm a, a historian of the United States in the 19th century. Um, I'm president emeritus at the University of Richmond, uh, and I'm working now to see if we can't make history teaching more interesting. My mom was a fifth grade teacher, and I told her I was going to go to graduate school in history, and she said, well, what for, honey? We already know what happened. And I think that's the way that a lot of people think of history, that we already know what happened. You got it all laid out there in the textbook. You got the multiple choice tests, seeing if you memorize what we told you. And I've sort of devoted my life to telling people, you know, that's not really the way history is. Uh, history is questions. It's not answers. Um, and so for 27 years, I taught at the University of Virginia before I went to Richmond, and then I taught there as well. So I've taught over 8,000 students. And at college level, I can see that it takes them a little while to understand that what we're trying to do is teach them to be a historian every day. We're all living in history every minute of our lives, but it's invisible. It's like the oxygen around us. Um, and so you can't really tell that you're living in time, except every once in a while, something we think of as historic happens. But all you have to do is go back and, and look at your high school yearbook and realize that you were living in history. That's why you have those really broad collars or that particular hairstyle you had, or that's why um, you thought that music was really the best music that had ever been created. That's all history. You're living in that every moment. And it became frustrating to me when I would teach freshmen in college and they would come in and they say, well, there's only a couple ways to evaluate history. One, is this historian bringing an opinion or bias to the story? Because the truth lies in primary documents and the historian's job is just to convey that truth and put it in the multiple choice test and the, uh, in the textbook. And I said, no, that's completely wrong. <laughs> that our whole idea is, is that historians don't begin with answers. We're constantly looking for new questions. And every single day we wake up, we're standing at a new place on the landscape. Time has changed overnight. There's a new perspective to offer. And so revisionism in history is not a bad thing. It's the natural thing. It's the way things should be. As I sometimes say, I want revisionist history just like I want revisionist medicine. <laughs> What's the latest thing you've learned? What's the new information you have? What's the new perspective that you bring? So when I finished up uh, my presidency, uh, I thought, what do I really care about now? And I thought, we live in a time where we have this incredible profusion of the internet and all these resources around us, videos such as the one you're watching now. Why can't we use that to invigorate what many students tell me they consider the most boring subject in school, history, and also most useless. Whereas I believe that there's nothing more useful than having some idea of where you stand in the flow of time, how it is that you came to be yourself, the shape of your family now and to come, how not just the politics, which people often equate with history, are changing in your time, but how the very fabric of your life is changing. So I thought, how could we share that perspective with younger students? Something that I can reveal to students in college or graduate school, but that is somehow not evident to them when they're middle school or high school. So it turns out in the early 1990s, I sort of stumbled into being uh, one of the first historians to experiment with what the World Wide Web might be able to make available. And we created this basically crazy <laughs> archive of every piece of information about every person who lived in a northern community and a southern community throughout the entire era of the Civil War and Reconstruction. And it's called the Valley of the Shadow. And uh, frankly, it won a bunch of awards and got attention in the New York Times and all these kinds of things. And the whole idea was, here is all the evidence on which I'm going to write two books, which ended up being over 800 pages long. But you figure out the story for yourself. You learn for yourself how you might weave these fragments into a coherent story. So we built that and people seem to like it. But I thought, boy, the web is changing so rapidly now. When we began, PDF files didn't exist. <laughs> we had to sort of write the code to do everything that your iPhone can do today. So I thought, how can we share that experience of discovering the past for yourself with younger students? I was able to enlist Annie Evans, who's a social studies coordinator in Charlottesville, Virginia, where I live. And Annie says, I can figure out ways to do this. 
but if we wait until high school, it's too late. Kids in middle school need to understand what history is and how we're active participants in history, in its understanding as well as creating history. So we be launched into a whole series of projects that we call New American History. Dot org. Uh, and in New American History, we have maps that are interactive, that every student in America can see themselves, where they live in the great stories of migration or of voting uh, or of uh, redlining or urban renewal, all these maps created by the Digital Scholarship Lab at the University of Richmond. But we also added in podcast. I was co-host of a podcast, Backstory, for 12 years, almost 300 episodes in which we turned over all these different rocks of American history. Also in a PBS series in which I was the host, uh, The Future of America's Past, where we visit historic sites and see how people are explaining to anybody who might show up some piece of the past every day. We also rebuilt the Valley of the Shadow, which by this time was almost 30 years old, into a form that works on your phone. It immediately adjusts to, to, to that. And the whole idea is that we want you to be a participant in understanding where you stand in American history. So as I thought about, so I've written books and I've taught all these students and I've been a president. Uh, what do I really care about? And what I really care about is having students understand why history matters and why it's actually interesting. And sometimes students would say, I, I'm just not interested in history. And I would say, well, how can everything that happened before today be boring? <laughs> it can't. And so that's my purpose is to, and I have a great pedagogical principle. It's very sophisticated. What if we made history interesting? What if instead of just watching a video about history, we put the raw materials for writing your own story in the hands of students. The other thing that I discovered teaching freshmen in college is that they thought history was the stuff in the textbooks and that history was sort of fixed. But I pointed out to them, every video game you play, every movie you watch, the music you're listening to, all those things are represented in history as well. So I thought of a project we call Bunk bunkhistory.org, uh, and what it does is curates every day all the way that history is appearing all around us in all different kinds of publications, everything from the trivial to the very heavy, from the funny to the quite, quite tragic. And the idea is, is that people can realize, wow, I didn't think that, that op-ed is history. That TV show is history. And by sharing in Bunk, and it's named after the Henry Ford quote, history is more or less Bunk, he said. The only history that matters is the history we make today. Well, Bunk is about the history we make today, the way that it's being presented to you. So the whole idea is to take history out of the box, take history out of these containers in which we've we shipped it, and instead say, you're living in history, it would be better if you understood history of the past. So we're working with students all across the United States at every level. You go to newamericanhistory.org, you'll see that it's all graded by reading level and by uh, grade level and standards and all those kind of things. So that teachers, who are the key people in all of this, and we trust teachers to know how to use these materials, can share with their students exciting new ways to understand the American past. So this project will never end. There's new history being made every day new tools being made every day. Uh, I wrote a book recently, uh, American Visions, that we built a beautiful website that has one minute videos that bring to life people in that book that, you know, they're dressed in old clothes. This is in the 1840s. Um, you know, the, the, even the, the photographs are not in color. Uh, their hairstyles seem really old fashioned. But it turns out they are profoundly interesting. One time they were as young as the students uh, who were watching these videos and reading about them. And they were wrestling with the same issues that students today are. Who am I? What is religious faith? How, how do I uh, relate to other people? What does America mean? So in all those ways, trying to take a kind of remote part of the past and make it seem a lot closer. So that's pretty much what I'm working on now, trying to make history exciting and accessible with the tools that we have that people didn't have even 10 years ago. This is what history is handing us, handing us this opportunity. We need to make the most of it. 
we can't just let history stand still while the rest of, of knowledge is swirling all around us. So what I look forward to is every day discovering history is new, trying to make it seem new, reveal how new it is to young people, uh, and try to remind myself and my memory of my mom, why would you want to do history? We don't already know what happened. There's new discoveries every day.